Welcome to episode 72 of the Civil War Breakfast Club podcast, joined once again by my co-host Mary, a woman from Canada who has received so much snow in the last two weeks that now, she now stands four center Marys above her head. I am merely a dirty snowball named Darren. Hey, Mary, how are you? Four center Marys. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's getting pretty tall. It's oh, tall. my it's God. Four center Marys tall worth of snow, you guys. How are you? What's going on? I'm... Um... I'm good. Uh, your little snowball reference reminded me of the time that uh, one of my roommates in university, she'd never experienced snow before. She uh, made a snowball and took it and froze it in her freezer. And the snowball's name for the entire year was Poor Bastard. So, okay. So <laughs> that's a great story. I love stories. That's good stuff. I don't know. That's it just reminded stuff. me of Poor Bastard. The snowball. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, so how, how are, are you? you? What's, what's, I'm, oh, I'm doing great until now. But it's been good. It's been fantastic. We had a pretty cool round table. We just we finished did. up here just a little while ago, which is great. We saw a lot of great people, a lot of great friends, a lot yeah. of great conversation, as always. And um, I guess I'm the host tonight, so I you get are. to ask the million-dollar question. And that question, of course, is what are you drinking? Well, I am drinking Ransack the Universe by Collective Arts, which when you tried that when we were in Gettysburg said tasted like Treehouse. So I think I'm drinking a pretty high in beer right now and i am drinking it out of my george h thomas rock of mill springs because today is the anniversary of the battle of mill springs drinking well out of that mug well played okay i am drinking mary it is called return of the yeti okay it is from a uh, log tavern our friend bill down in gettysburg bought this for us nice and uh, it is really good and of course i got it because it's a return because we're going to do the second battle of fort fisher and the union's going to return to finish Very the nice. job see what i did i tied that together right there you're and just so creative it, i'm having one of those days i'm drinking it out of my um charles tilden mug uh, that the great john the purchased for us and sent nice. to us he uh buys stuff when you can go onto his red bubble page and buy a bunch of cool stuff so that's what I got. That's what I'm 16th doing. 16th main for the win. You got a 16 is greater. That than salient 20, is so. an amazing place to smoke cigars. Certainly is. Certainly is. So what's on, what's on tap tonight, Mary? What's going on? So we are going to stay at Fort Fisher where we were last week and we are going to talk part two of Fort Fisher. Um, but we thought we were also going to end it tonight, but next week we're going to be talking a part three with Wilmington. So we're doing, we're doing the, uh, Second Battle of Fort Fisher. We're yep. going to take it on to part three. We're going to talk about the Battle of Wilmington or the Siege of Wilmington next week. Yep. We're going to finish it up because we had so much fun in Fort Fisher. We decided to kick back, put our feet up, and spend the whole episode talking about this. So let's recap real quick where mm -hmm. we were last time we talked. Yep. When we last saw Fort Fisher, Mary, the combined forces of Benjamin Butler and Admiral David Porter had just got pantsed in their attempts to capture that garrison um, that protected that Confederate supply, supply hub of the city of the town of Wilmington, North Carolina, on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, 1864. It wasn't really so much a huge defeat for the Federals as it was where a situation where Butler felt, which was supported by his subordinate, uh, a guy who was opposed to run the campaign, a guy named Godfrey Weitzel, but the fort was too strong for them to take, and so they took their ball and went home. So real quick, Mary, in case you forgot, which was 50-50, the okay. yeah, Wilmington was the only Confederate seaport left for the Rebs after Mobile yeah, fell in August of 1864, right? And it was the life uh, lifeline, the lifeblood supply line for Robert E. Lee at this time. Now, Lee knew holding Wilmington in its haven for supplies um, that, were, that were carried by those blockade runners was everything for Fort Fisher mm -hmm. and what that was protecting it. And if the loss of Fort Fisher would mean the loss of Wilmington, which would mean the loss of their supplies, which would mean the loss of Robert E. Lee's army and probably the loss of the Confederacy. Exactly. And that's exactly what he told Lamb, who is, he's at the garrison in Fort, Fort Fisher. And Lee tells him, yeah, if you lose Fort Fisher in Wilmington, then, then that's it for Richmond. So you can't imagine, we're going to see this later in, in this episode, the pressure that Lamb is feeling and what he has to do because he knows what Robert E. Lee has said to him about like, yeah, if you fucking lose this place, dude, like we're aft, we're going to lose Richmond. And it's, you know, and at this time as well, and this isn't surprising is Lee is starting to run low on munitions and essential supplies. And that is because of what is happening in the Western theater 
with Sherman and his march to the sea. And now he's going through the Carolinas. It's into December, into January. Mm -hmm. He's starting to go through the Carolinas. He's ripped up all that railway through Georgia and the munitions cannot get through to Lee like they were because the infrastructure has basically been destroyed. So Mm -hmm. Lee's realizing he's slowly and it's kind of starting to actually go rather quickly being bled to death right now, his army. It, it is. In between the first and second battles, there are going to be some changes. You know, after that first battle, the one that ran from December 24th to 25th, 1864, um, which had which absolutely was a surprise that Benjamin Butler's completely foolproof plan of blowing up 215 Shocking. tons of black powder in the U.S. Louisiana did not work. Um, he, uh, you'll notice my um, sarcasm. There. No, I did. It's shocking. I was thinking it's kind of like the crater yeah. mm-hmm. where that. Well, it's true. Shit show too. But Butler got himself dumped from command, much to the delight of U.S. Grant, who hated him more than I hate the Buffalo Bills. That's how much he could not stand. Oh, I him, do okay? not like the Buffalo nope. Bills right now either. Okay, we're just going to let, let that go right there. Okay? Yeah, we'll let that. But, we won't discuss that. But the thing is that everyone, the Union and the Confederates, knew that the Federals absolutely had to try this again. And they had to try it again soon. Now, the fort, especially Wilmington, had to be in the North's pocket and to cut that vital supply line that we just talked about. It was the only thing keeping the Confederate hopes alive on the field. Now, with Benjamin Butler sent home to Low Mass, U.S. Grant is going to need a commander uh, of that force. And he turned to a guy named Major General Alfred Terry. Now, Terry is a New Englander, so you know he's smart, probably also hated the Bills, but he's from Hartford, Connecticut, and he was born November 10th, 1827. He wasn't military trained, he was a lawyer. He graduated from Yale Law School in 1848. And when the war started, he kind of like Rufus Dawes did with Wisconsin, Mm -hmm. he he joined, but he raised his own regiment. He's gonna raise the second Connecticut, which is gonna participate in the first Battle of Manassas on July 21st, 1861. He's then eventually gonna take over that seventh Connecticut, um, he's going to get his star. He's going to get his um, the general his general star in April 1862, and he'll take over command of that Morris Island division of the 10th Corps. And he was instrumental in that siege of, of Charleston and Morris Island in, in South Carolina in 1863. Yep. He was involved in the fight uh, in Grimble's Landing, which of course is made famous by Robert Gould Shaw's 54th Mass, as well as the assault on Battery Wagner. So he he'll end up taking over that 10th Corps. Um, in the army at, uh, of the James after its commander, David Bell Burney, got stomach issues, tried to blame the cart, but died anyway in October 1864. So despite Terry's success, the thing about him was despite his success, he seemed to always fly under the radar. No matter, he has some success, but no one in Washington seemed to notice. Now, yeah. one person who did notice Terry's success was a guy named Ulysses S. Grant. Yeah. So when Grant needed a guy and he wanted to take another run at Fort Fisher, t- Terry was going to be his guy. Yeah. And that's also because Terry was going to get along with Porter as well. Um, he knew that, you know, Terry and Porter were going to work together because Terry understands the importance of working with the Navy. And so he and Porter get together to make this plan. And the other thing that Grant does for him too, is he increases the size of troops that uh, he's going to have there because Grant is like, okay, well, maybe if we have more, they're going to be a little bit more threatened. So what was a force of just 6,500 troops is going to become a force of close to 89,000 troops that he's going to have there, as well as the Navy. And Porter's going to be there leading the Navy again, because it's Porter. Why not? Right. Mm -hmm. And he's going to have approximately 60 vessels and a force of 2,000 sailors and Marines. So the important thing to note about Fort Fisher on the second battle is the Marines are there too. And the Marines are another one, like the Navy, they don't get talked about a lot in the Civil War. No, this is going to be one of those few times the Marines, when we talk about this, this is not going to be one of their better days, but we'll talk in detail about that. But, you know, Terry and Porter are a natural fit. They really, really are. Mm, They are. It's going to be that because they, you remember how much Butler and uh, Porter did not get along. These guys do get along, but Terry, um, you know, Terry has that experience with the siege of Charleston, and he's going to join up with Porter to try to finish that job that that Butler and and um, and Butler and Porter could not do. So the pressure at this point was absolutely on the Union, despite the November election already being over now. Taking over Wilmington and removing that monstrous Fort Fisher and eliminating that blockade line 
was a gigantic issue. Gustavus Foxmary, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, said this country will not forgive us for another failure at Wilmington. And he was right about that. They had to have it. So on the Confederate side, they knew that the Union needs to take Fort Fisher and Wilmington. They just knew. Commanding the garrison was uh, Major General William H.C. Whiting from last time, as well as the aforementioned by you, Colonel William Lamb. Now, Mm -hmm. Robert E. Lee, at this point, he's in the midst of throwing and taking haymakers from U.S. Grants in Petersburg (laughs) at this point as part of that Grants Overland campaign, right? Now, despite needing men because he needed men to fight Grant, he's going to send a division under Robert F. Hoke to Wilmington to help add to the rebel numbers. Lee knew that Wilmington's supply line was everything for him, and he was going to risk that many guys to send down there, even though it meant weakening his army against Grant, who was dealing with him in that Petersburg area. Yeah, and so he's going to send Hoke down there, and the other person who's also down down there, too, is Bragg. Yeah, we'll, well. we'll talk about Bragg because Bragg, Bragg, you know, he's an interesting cat. You know, um, the thing about Hoke, though, is he's going to have 6,500 guys, right? Yeah. And he's going to get there sort of the, towards the end of the first battle around yeah. Christmas time. It's too late to really do anything. And then he's um, just kind of hanging he's still, out. He's still going to be there. Now, you know, Whiting, you know, he's prepping for this inevitable second attack yep. on the fort. And he wanted, you know, and he wanted more men. Right. So he's going to send a message to your boy Braxton Bragg. Yep. He says, I hope that on any renewal of an attempt to land, the enemy will not be allowed to do so without opposition. Now, General Braxton Bragg, okay, we'll talk about him. You know, he is going to be sent to Wilmington, um, and he is a huge supporter of his BFF, Jefferson Davis, in Richmond, right? Um, October 1864, he's going to go there to take command of this Confederate force in the area. Now, he had a really bad reputation already, especially in the Southern press. The, um, when he got to, when, when it was announced that he was, that Bragg was going to Wilmington, the Richmond Inquirer wrote, Braxton Bragg has been ordered to Wilmington. Goodbye, Wilmington. That's what they wrote. God, what, could they so, see into the fucking future? <laughs> so they, they, they just knew, they just knew. God, well, I mean, it's. I mean, his reputation at that point has been, I mean, Bragg has his good days, but then he just kind of goes on this like kind of sharp decline, I guess you could say. And he, you know, Whiting is sending him messages saying, you know, could you help? And as we're going to see, Bragg's like, Bragg does not either he's in denial about what the threat is, or he just doesn't give a fuck. Well, it's one of the two. And I'm not I, sure I which my, it is. I have my own opinion. We'll go with this towards the end. But I, 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 the posi- it's his decision to do what he did is be very, very flawed. And we'll talk about yeah. that. So early on, uh, early on January 6th, 1865, the Union Army transports are carrying 10,000 men of the Federal Army of the James under Terry. And they're going to go covertly. They're going to depart from Hampton Roads. Now, Admiral David Porter's fleet this time has 58 ships instead of the 64 last time. They're going to depart around the same time from Beaufort, North Carolina, and they're going to be heading towards Cape Fear and Fort Fisher. Now, the Union game plan this time is a little bit different. The Battle of Fort First, the Battle of First Fort Fisher, so that three times quick, okay? <laughs> Their game plan was take out Fort Fisher to stop the Confederate blockades. That yeah. was the whole point. This time is different, okay? They want to take out Fort Fisher, and then once they take it out, they're going to take out Wilmington. Yeah, so this is this it's a little it's a little bit different because it's a two pronged approach, right? Right, right. They know they need to cut Lee's supply line as well as to what you mentioned before, help Sherman's campaign, can, uh, Carolina campaign, which is already underway. So you kill with two birds and one stone here, literally and figuratively, mm-hmm. right? So by the evening there of the sixth, the fleet is it can, is starting to be seen from the Fort Fisher parapets. Colonel Lamb. Yeah, he's standing on that parapet, and he says, "I saw from the ramparts of the fort the lights of the Great Armada, as one of another appeared on the horizon." So the boats are coming; they knew they were coming. The funny part about it, this is this is going to be right around the twelfth of June. Yep. I mean, of January. What's Bragg doing at this time? He's in Wilmington. He's having Whitman. a big. He's worse than he's. Well, he finishes whittling. He's having a review and parade of his troops. He's what the hell? Around, like, right? he's just so in, I don't know. He seems so just, 
not really i don't want to know just, what's going on but i'm just gonna ignore well, it i i, I think who knows but jefferson davis he knew the importance of wilmington he's going to message brag in regards to this effort to hold on a four fisher in, in the town and he's and jefferson davis uh, says to on to brag we are trustfully looking to your operations may divine favor crown your efforts Whoa. so they're basically he's sitting there with his fingers crossed going please you know no. Wow. Meanwhile, Early. Lamb is sitting there on the 12th and saying, you know, sunrise the next morning revealed to us the most formidable, formidable armada the world had ever known, supplemented by transports carrying 8,500 troops. They saw them all coming. I mean, you can see them coming a mile away, right? So early that next day, around one o'clock in the morning on the 13th, Bragg is actually going to order the main body of Hoax Division to mm-hmm. go, via, go via land from Wilmington to a place called Sugarloaf. We talked about it last time. It's a few miles up the peninsula from Fort Fisher. It is between Wilmington and Fort Fisher. Now, Hoke is going to send one of his North Carolina brigades um, under William Kirkland. He's going to send him kind of up through the, um, down a steamer down to the Cape Fear River. But he's, he's trying to sit and get people down there, okay? Now, the Union attack will begin with a massive bombardment from Porter's gunboat, just like last time. That will happen simultaneously with a Union infantry attack on the lands for um, the forts land faced by three divisions of the, of the 24th Corps, around 10,000 guys, including brigades from the U.S. Colored Troops. OK, the attack will be assisted by a second land attack on the Fort Sea Force, uh, Sea Face, by 2,300 plus men from these naval Marines you just talked about under David Porter. Mm-hmm. The whole thing's going to begin on Friday the 13th of January 1865. So it's bad, bad juju right there for the yeah. Confederacy, right? You know, um, so, you know, the, the sun is going to rise early in about 7.20 in the morning on the 13th of January. A group of Union gunboats are going to begin shelling that peninsula about four miles north of Fort Fisher. Now, this is going to be that federal landing zone, okay? Think D-Day. They're going to pound yeah. the beach, get rid of all the artillery, get all the, and, and so they can land their guys. Soon later, another naval bombardment is going to pound Fort Fisher's land front. And what this is going to do is destroy rebel telegraph lines and cover that whole area with smoke so they can't see what the hell's going on. Right. Yeah. yeah. And unlike before, with the fir- first Fort Fisher, when Porter was like, oh, yeah, my shots have hit every mark. And Lamb was like, yeah, that was a waste of gunpowder. This time, the shots are going to hit their mark. And it was described that the earth was trembling from this bombardment they were hitting their mark they were so accurate in how they were doing it and i think that um goes back to the comment that you said in our first episode about it that the first episode was really like it became a recon so i think porter was able to see from that first time okay this is how the fort is that second time he goes in which is right now he's able to aim the guns a lot better tell the men where to aim lamb's probably not doing his whole thing like oh i'm gonna move the fucking flag around on you now Mm -hmm. um porter's able to aim because he knows what he's aiming at they know their Mm -hmm. target now they didn't know that in the first battle right well the the first battle they were aiming at the flags because they couldn't see it yeah and and, ford is slow exactly this time this time they were aiming at the flags they were aiming at the guns north on the land face and yeah. on the beach in front of the sea face that they were smart this time they weren't firing on the fort they were firing just north of it and just northeast of it now by eight o'clock in the morning the, these union troops are going to begin embarking from those transports for this amphibious landing um on, on a place called federal point and thousands of federal troops under division commanders adele bart ames and charles Payne are going to come ashore at federal point now north of the landing point at sugarloaf the confederates they're they're there under robert hoke they're going to solidify their defensive position, right? He's going to sit back and let them land because what he's afraid of is weakening his line and allowing Union troops to march north right past him to get into Wilmington. Now, here's here's the thing with Bragg, and here's what I think, okay? Bragg had a gigantic tactical error in his head. But he, his goal in his mind was protecting Wilmington. So he did not want to commit enough troops to Fort Fisher, thinking that was going to weaken his yeah. chance to defend. But what he didn't realize, if Fort Fisher fell, Wilmington didn't matter anymore. Exactly. Because what, what is the sense of defending Wilmington if you lose Fort Fisher? And that's the great flaw with this with Braxton Bragg. He is so convinced that he can't commit troops to protect Fort Fisher because if he does, 
he won't have enough to fight at Wilmington. When at the end of the day, you lose Fort Fisher, you lose the blockade runners, Wilmington's gone anyway. And this is the part of the problem with Hoke too, is he doesn't want to commit troops to fight Fort Fisher for that same reason, because he thinks that these Union troops are going to go right through them, and they're going to head into Wilmington. But, you know, the first thing that Alfred Terry does when he gets there, he's going to send a division of the, and they knew, the Union knew this too. They're mm-hmm. going to send a division under, uh, under the USCT, under Charles Payne, yeah. up that peninsula to get between hoax rebs and Sugarloaf, right? And, and the Union men on the peninsula. What they kind of want to do is they kind of want to keep them there and pin them there. Now, Payne, he's a commander of the 3rd Division of the 24th Corps. He's a Boston guy, Mayor. I don't know if you know this. He's a Boston I'm, guy, Charles Wow. Payne. And, and here's another thing that's cool about him. You know what he did after the war? What's that? He owned three yachts. All three of them won the America's Cup. Nice. Kind of cool. Hey, cool Boston nice. guy. You know, we, we win here usually. You're always a winner in my book. Don't worry. Okay. Well, anyway, but the, <laughs> other, the, other, the, the other part of, the, of this Union hammer, right, will be swung by a force of 2,361 naval marines from Porter's boats under the command of a guy named Lieutenant. He's a guy from Philly. Named Lieutenant Kidder Brees. Amazing name. name. I was just looking at his name. Amazing name. Definitely a cool name. Definitely one of the members of the All Sabor name team. Yeah. You know, but the plan is Ames is going to land uh, on the is going to send these guys to the land face of Fort Fisher, which is kind of like the northeast. Think yeah. of Fort Fisher looks like a seven from the sky. That's kind yeah. of what it looks like. Oh, so it's not a popsicle like it usually. No, not a popsicle. No, it's a, this one's a seven. Okay, now right at the bend where the seven connects. That corner on the top right is where Brees' guys are targeting. Yeah, okay? at the, the northeast the north, bastion, right? The, north, the northeast bastion. You got it, okay? So while this is all going on, these 58 gunboats are going to rain shells down in this fort, okay? By the way, speaking of Brees, Mary, you know where he's buried? He's buried in Newport, Rhode Island, right near Guru K. Warren. Same area. Don't know why. Wow. That's where he's buried. So he's a Philly Gotta guy. Gotta go there but someday. He chose to spend his attorney in New England. But you know, there you go, right? Nice. But, but in, in, inside the fort, Lamb now, Confederate, you know, um, the, uh, William Lamb, he is going to be joined by General Whiting to get some reinforcements. He'll have about 1,500 men at his disposal to defend the fort for the Confederates. Now, Whiting, you know, he, he's knowing these federal troops are on the peninsula now, right? Will we'll message yet again, yeah. he'll message Braxton Bragg and is incredulous at why they are not being attacked. No, his, Bra- message, his message his message says, the enemy is on the beach. Where have you been all day? Why are they not being attacked? That's yeah. literally what the message to Braxton Bragg was. And it's not great in the fort either because Lamb says that after the bombardments, it's made it possible to repair the damage on the land face at night. No meals could be prepared for the exhausted garrison and not more than three or four of my land guns were serviceable. So in the fort, it's not great at mm-hmm. all. Well, think of a chessboard, okay? Terry, yeah. you know, Terry and, and um, Porter are setting up the pieces at this point and they get yeah. ready to attack. They're putting everything in motion. So by yeah. early Saturday morning on the 14th of January, Terry's troops are digging entrenchments in a place called Battery Anderson. And, and, and right on the Cape Fear River. Now, by eight o'clock in the morning, that line spans the entire peninsula, okay? At this point, Hope realizes the Union line is way too strong to attack it. And as the morning goes on, Whiting is getting more and more frustrated at Bragg, who seemingly is just sitting around letting the whole situation happen and not doing anything about it. So it, you, you can imagine the frustration of these guys. So around lunchtime, right around noon, He's going to message Bragg yet again. He's going to say, the game of the enemy is very plain to me. I have received dispatches from you stating that the enemy has extended to the riverbank, which they never have been allowed to do. If they remain there, the reduction of Fort Fisher is but a question of time. I will hold this place to the last extremities, but unless you drive that land force from from its position, I cannot answer for the security of the harbor. So Whiting now is like, what the hell? They're re- realizing for the most part, he's going to have this quote to Lamb. He's going to yeah. basically say, dude, we're, we're sacrificed. Yeah, we're, we yeah he says we're sacrificing ourselves. And so that's going to be a really crappy feeling, right? To know oh. that they're being left and you don't know why. Bragg's actually going to reply to him. 
and he's going to send, he's going to say, I'm, I'm just going to send some refor- reinforcements from Hulk, which he does, yep. that will render the fort impregnable against assault. And I will talk about that. Well, that's you what know, Bragg believed. He thought like Fort Fisher was impregnable against anything. Well, he's going to send, he's going to send troops under a guy named Johnson Haygood. Okay. His brigade, mm-hmm. mostly guys from the 11th and 21st South Carolina. And it's going to total around a thousand men. But here's the problem: out of the thousand men, you know how many make it to the fort? Three fifty. Exactly. Make it. Yeah. So that's thirty-five percent. Not not good, you know. So late in the day of the fourteenth, Terry and the chief a Union engineer a guy named Cyrus Comstock is going to arrive in Battery Holland. Okay, and will reconnoitre that fort along with Newton, Martin, Curtis. Now, now we talked about last time. They all agree at this point. The fort is ripe for the picking. They it know is. they got it. Um, they know that the, the, the uh, gunboat attacks have taken out uh, just about all the rebel defenses north of the fort. So on the morning of January 15th, the Union has destroyed just about every rebel gun on that land face all of Fort but Fisher. Four. Right. And there was an eight-inch Columbiad. And, and, um, and all 4,000 men now of Ames are in position. So they are yep. locked and loaded. Meanwhile... Cushing's brigade is in nearby Battery Holland in that second brigade under a guy named Galusha Pennypacker. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> it's an amazing company, name. Okay, well, it's we'll not, talk about. it's not that like, it's not the AM Sterling Wood, but it's still good. I don't know. There might be a future Starbucks cup name right there. Galusha. You can't go wrong with Galusha. Galusha would be amazing. So yes, would, um, but- what's his name? Kidder. Oh, yeah, Kidder Breeze is a good one. But Galusha Kenny Pack needs to be there with his third brigade under Lewis Bell has, has landed there as well. So he's getting all these guys. Meanwhile, this continuous barrage from the gunboats is still raining down again and falling among these newly arriving reinforcements of Battery Buchanan under Haygood. And that's a big reason why they only got 350. The gunboats had a big part of it, yeah. right? Now, on the sea face of the fort, those 2,261 Marines are going to be under Porter have arrived on shore Federal Point. Now, the main force of Curtis's brigade is 300 yards north of the fort, and Pennypacker and Bell are behind Curtis, right? Yeah. And all the dominoes are lined up, and Terry's ready to pull the trigger on the second assault of Fort Fisher. Yep, he is. And he's going to send Curtis in first to do that well, first and- he, he, he he will but he he needs he's what he's going to do first and foremost he's going to signal them and then a lot of the, the yep. confederate diaries talk about this signal so right around 3 30 p.m mm-hmm. the shells from the gunboats on the land face are just going to stop okay and several gunboats all of a sudden a lot of these gunboats sound this ear piercing blast of st- these steam whistles okay that is so loud it can be heard as far away as a Kincard and DQ. That's how far away these things can be heard. Kincard and DQ. And what this thing is, this is the starting gun of the attack, and everybody knew it. Hmm. So, okay. No, and that's when that's when Ames is going to send Curtis in, and he goes in there, and he gets a very he takes very heavy fire, very heavy casualties. And he gets overrun at the outer works as he and he storms the first traverse, and it's brutal hand to hand combat there. And you know, Ames is watching this happen with Pennypacker. He he does, and you feel but you got to feel bad for Curtis. I mean, you know, Curtis he told people he was six foot seven. Do you know that? Yes, most, I was most, reading that about most him. Most people most people think he he was six foot five. And don't you hate oh, so he, he said he was hate. two don't inches light. Yeah. Less no, than I, I, he was. You know, who the hell embellishes their height? It's, it's, it's crazy, but that's what okay. it was, you know? But they say they say Winfield Scott was the tallest man in the army. It was six foot five, but this Curtis said he was six foot seven. But anyway, I, I, I digress. Anyways, um, so he takes very heavy fire, and that's when Penny Packer has to go in. And Ames is going to go forward with him, and the Confederate snipers start to target these men. And his men fight through the Riverside Gate and Ames orders them into the fort, despite all this heavy fire that they're undering. So this is absolutely brutal fighting that Mm -hmm. these guys are under in the Union. You know, Curtis is experiencing hand to hand combat when Penny Packer and Ames go in. It's they're they're being targeted by these snipers here. Right. But before they get to that point, though, the initial phase of the attack was those Marines. Right. Yeah. So Porter's, Porter's Marines uh, under Captain Breeze, those 2,200 plus guys, they're going to be they're going to begin to march on the northeast face of the fort. And the, the reason why I mentioned this is because 
all the attention of the force focused on them, right? Mm -hmm. The action, the, 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 that action on this Northeast point, you know, it, it, you know, it brought all the boys to the yard is what it did, okay? Mm -hmm. Including, you know, the Confederate leadership, Whiting and Lamb, right? So, and they're gonna personally lead the defenses. So what's going on is they're fighting. Now, the Marines are gonna quickly start to have problems. The first thing, the first reason why is these 2,300 guys aren't in the same division. They're all volunteers from all of the 58 boats. They've never fought together, to, together especially on land. Yeah. That's part of the problem. The second problem was they all fought with pistols and swords. That's what they had to fight with, which is yeah, brutal. No thanks. And the third thing was they were supposed to attack in three waves. And what they did is they all went berserk and did one big mass confusion run. So yeah, it was that's very how, like just disorganized. You know, so when they approach the fourth, the Rebs who are waiting for them, they're on top of the parapets. They just are pouring fire down on these poor guys and devastated these, these Marines. Now, Whiting himself stood on the rampart, swearing at the top of his lungs, screaming at his men to kill them all. He must have been an angry fellow, that Whiting. But he would that he was fired up. But the Marines got completely routed and they got forced and they, they fell back. And it made the rebels scream at the top of their lungs in joy. It reminded me of you when you saw the Howard statue that day in Gettysburg. You're so, so oh, happy. yes, I was so yeah. happy. But here's the thing. And it was right at this moment when those rebel cheers stopped and the pucker effect turn, took over, right? Because yep. Lamb and Whiting, they're going to look to their west. And what are they going to see? They're going to see those Union flags of exactly. Ames over that western salient of the fort. Now, the main attack on Fort Fisher would not be from these Marines on the northeast bastion there. It's going to be on that western face. And that's what the rebels were not ready for. Exactly. And that's the attack that I was mentioning earlier, where it's yep. Curtis that goes in first with, and he takes the heavy casualties um, when he overruns the outer works and storms the first traverse. And then Ames says to Pennypacker, okay, we're fucking doing this now. And they go in and they take sniper fire and it's hand to hand combat in there. And that's when um, Ames orders uh, Lewis Bellin. And he's ordered forward because the other Union troops are stopped at the first traverse. And well, they, they, Bell they, they ends up getting killed. They, they get there. They get there. Little, little time has gone by before we get to that point, though. And <laughs> basically, right. for, no, it's, it's okay. But I mean, um, you know, Curtis is going to initially send in his 100 guys because he needs to take out the abatees yep. and the parapets. They have to get in there to make the point. So once they get through this, like you were saying, they start pouring through Fort Fisher, mm -hmm. getting into that Western end. Now they're going to take those heavy casualties and they talk a lot about the hand-to-hand -hand combat. Yeah, right? it's now, brutal. They, they were literally at arm's length fighting with everything from fists to broken labats bottles to axes. Whatever <laughs> that's the they worst. Had. Jeez, like, that's they, like they, a battle in Huron County, broken labats it, bottles. What are you talking it, about? That's it, me in high was, school. It was like a like a crazy hockey fight gone wild, and it yeah. just went and went. Um, that second wave is going to be from Penny Packer, who's going to mm -hmm. continue to drive his way into the fort. They're going to be out of that 200, 203rd Pennsylvania, and they're going to clear that passage. And then minutes later, federal troops are in the fort, and they're in the parade ground. So they're just yeah. streaming through. Now, these Union troops are going to pour in from the north and through that Riverside Gate, and they're gonna, um, that was opened after the feds took out a 12 pound Napoleon that was right there. Um, but the thing is, that you, to try to stop the onslaught, the Rebs are gonna kind of start firing from a, a battery south of the fort, a place called Battery Buchanan. Okay. Yep. Now they're gonna start firing willy nilly into the fort and it's gonna take out some of their own guys, but they're desperate at this point, right? Oh, absolutely. The, the Union troops are taking a beating as well because, and also many of their officers are being taken out. So the second uh, brigade commander, Galusha Pennypacker, is going to be hurt here. Yep. He's going to plant the flag of the 97th Pennsylvania on that third traverse, and he's going to be immediately hit. He'll survive. Um, by now, it's around four o'clock, okay? And many of these Rebs have fallen back into the fort, and Ames is there, and he's like surveying the situation, seeing what the deal is. And he notices his troops are running out of gas. They've yeah. been going full speed. Don't forget they've been fighting hand to hand for hours now. And he's going to finally send at this point in that third brigade under Lewis Bell, guys from New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, Indiana, yeah. and New York. Yeah. And that's because the troops are stopped at the fourth, tra fourth traverse. 
and bell ends up being killed pretty early on by a sharp sh- sharpshooter um but the other thing that happens here is like things are getting so so desperate for the confederates that Whitting is going to lead a counterattack, and he charges the Union soldiers who are like, okay, you need to stop and surrender. And he's like, I'm not surrendering. And they end up shooting him and he gets wounded. Um, and not only that. So at this point, the fighting gets so desperate and lamb um, is, you know, all he's got in his head is the fact that, you know, Robert E. Lee has told him if, you know, you know, Fort Fisher falls, if Wilmington falls, then Richmond is done. And, and I don't know what I'm going to do after this. We, we can't go on. He rallies the men that are sick and wounded and to try and fight and to hold the union. He, he does. And meanwhile, you know, Whitey, he's, he's injured. He, he has that counterattack. He yeah. gets hurt, but he does, he doesn't, he gets hurt kind of bad, but not, not as bad as you yeah. think he does. He's going to message Bragg again around this point yeah. right before the whole thing happens with Lamb. He's going to message Bragg. He's going to say, we still hold the fort, but are sorely pressed. Can you assist us from the outside? Both Whitey and Lamb are hoping and praying at this point that Bragg is going to send somebody. Um, and this is when the battle again kind of stalls as they, for the Union side because they're running out of gas again. And what happens is almost out of a movie, when they slow down, what happens, the Union gunboats start again. Yeah, right? they do. They start firing the shells in the sea, and it starts painting the shells uh, into the fort. The rebels are going to fall back. Now, Lamb, you know, this is what he mentioned before. He at this point he's desperate. Any port in the storm, he's going to run into that U, that federal the Confederate hospital in the that bomb proof underground, and he's going to start pulling out injured and sick soldiers. To Can try you to imagine fight, right? doing that? I mean, these poor guys are hurt. They're lying in bed. They it's a day off. Who the hell knows? But they're they're in there, and they they're going to go. Um, and really, you know, he, it's, this is probably around four 30 in the afternoon or so. Um, and he's I mean, been I, advised know, to surrender at this point. He's been told yeah. you need to surrender the fort, but he's got in his head, like what Lee said to him about, mm-hmm. if you lose this, we're going to lose Richmond. Yeah, it's, it's true. And, and he's going to, you know, like you said a minute ago, he's going to get hurt is really as soon as he starts to arrange that counterattack, he's going to get hurt. The funny thing is he actually gets taken to that. That host, that field hospital in, yep. in the bomb proof. And who is in there is uh, is Whiting because yeah. he's been hurt too. And they're laying right next to each other. I would have loved to be a fly on the wall here, that conversation. Like, what the friggin' hell? <laughs> what um, is happening? What, how, so, like, yeah, yeah. Lamb is probably like, so have you heard back from uh, Braxton yet? What's going on with that shit? They're like, because they're, they're, they're thinking this is going to be the worst. This is the worst day ever. You know, Whiting and Lamb are both down. So the commander of the four is going to fall to a guy named Major James Riley, who has been mm-hmm. commanding that 10th North Carolina. Now, yep. Riley's going to try to rally the men. And he's going to gather around 200 guys at the back door of the, the savannah of the fort. Called this, it's called Ooh. the Sally Port. Okay, that's he's going to Ooh. try to get them through there. He will lead a counterattack, but it will fall flat. He'll lose two thirds of his men right there. That gate will be known as the Bloody Gate. That's how that thing goes. It's a real creative name, but appropriate, I suppose. But the Union victory at this point for Newton Curtis has got to be so small, so close, he can smell it as darkness is falling. And though Ames, Ames wants to entrench for the night, and we got this yeah. to finish up tomorrow. Curtis is like, screw that. Let's freaking go. So yeah. it's about 530, and he's going to get fired up to go, and he's going to be seriously wounded himself now, Curtis is. He's going to get hit and because he's going to try to get reinforcements. So um, his, little, his bravado kind of cost him. And I guess, you know, as this goes on, you know, Terry – Terry's going to notice around this point that the Union advance is starting to slow again. Just think of it like a wave. It goes, it tips. Well, it just, it's it just, like it we've just talked is. about many times before. Like you, you have adrenaline for so long in these battles, you know, and then all of a sudden it's like exhaustion hits you. And we saw it at Antietam where around noontime, the soldiers on both sides just get exhausted and they rest. Right. And that's probably where these guys are getting now. They're it was, exhausted. T- their, their adrenaline has mm-hmm. run out. But Terry's going to notice this, and so he's going to blow the conch shell again. In this time, he's going to have General Charles Payne to send his 27th USCT troops under Alan Blackman in. Okay, he wants to do this. Now, Whiting is going to message Bragg 
he must have he must have diff, you know free data. He's been measuring this guy so much at this point. Better you know? cell phone reception than I do here. Yeah. Bragg is at Sugarloaf at this point, and he messages Bragg and says the enemy are assaulting us by land and sea. Their infantry outnumber us. Can you not help us? Right now, Bragg for whatever reason is hearing these rumors that Fort Fisher is going to fall. He gets this message, but he kind of blows it off again. Mm -hmm. He will He will eventually, at this point, send a message to Wilmington. This is Bragg now, a message to Wilmington saying Fort Fisher is under control, which is the 19th century version of Kevin Bacon saying, all is well in the, in the movie Animal House, right? Yeah, That's exactly. What this is. Yeah. You know? yeah, we're all good. It's all good. Now, Bragg's thinking, okay, everything's falling apart. It's a big mess. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to change commanders. I'm going to send General Alfred, Alfred Colquitt now to go take over the fort. Like that's going to make a friggin' difference. So he's going to send Colquitt, not to, not troops to help the fort, but him and a three man staff on a rowboat. And they're going to row merrily, merrily down from Sugarloaf <laughs> to head to Fort, fort Fisher. He doesn't send, he's going to say he thinks just by changing the changing the band-aid is going to make the you know make it go away right well, it's like now, moving the deck chairs around on the fucking titanic right. while it's sinking what's it going to exactly. do so while this is going on terry is going to is actually going to get to the fort himself this is around seven o'clock at night now with with uh with cyrus comstock um and comstock actually talks terry out of committing the rest of Payne's division because he's thinking you know what we need to keep that northern line strong just in case, because in case they do send reinforcements. So he kind of doesn't really, he doesn't really send anybody else. But with everything pretty much lost now, James Riley, who's now in charge mm -hmm. of the fort, will evacuate both William Whiting and Charles Lamb out of that hospital to the southern point of the peninsula where Battery Buchanan is, where they were firing the, firing the guns on the fort. Now, as the Union continues to drive, the rest of the Confederates are, are rushing to Battery Buchanan, like recess just got recalled. They're they're that they're heading that quickly because they know the fort can't be defended anymore. Mm -hmm. They know that the, the jig is up, the horse is out of the barn. So um Colquist and his aides are gonna arrive around 10 o'clock PM now. This is the guy that Bragg sent to take over for Whiting and for Lamb. Yeah. Now at this point, the Confederates are all stuck on that southern peninsula. And Ames has now set up a strong defense inside the fort. So they own the fort now. They do. And, me, and meanwhile, north of the fort, Payne's division has set up that strong defensive line. And oh, by the way, there are 58 gunships still off the coast. Exactly. At you. you know that, that meme that this is fine, that dog? Yeah, the dog, the burning. It, yeah, yeah, that's perfect for that. This is what it was invented right here. Yeah, exactly. Moment, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. So... At this point, Major, you know, Major Riley says he pulls out his F this card. Says, I'm, <laughs> I'm too old for this shit. And he's going to raise the white flag. He's going to surrender the fort. Now, yep. Alfred Terry is going to arrive at Barry, Barry Buchanan and is going to receive that formal surrender from Whiting. And it, the funny part about it is just at this moment, Colquitt basically arrives. And you know what he yep. does? Turns around, goes back. Yeah. Nope. So, nope. <laughs> God. Nope. He says, he says, turn, turn around. Like, nope. We're not doing that shit. Base says, roll them up, kids. <laughs> you know, and that's pretty much how it goes. <laughs> you know? And then, so after Fort Fisher fell, like Bragg would write Jeff Davis that he was quote unquote mortified that it fell. Well, that's, that's, that's the, the best biggest part about bullshit it. statement but, of the Civil War. But, he sends the message, I am mortified at having um, to report the unexpected capture of Fort Fisher with most of the garrison at about 10 o'clock tonight, but taking which are not known. Here's what's cool about that line. That message, you know, we first sent it to was Robert E. Lee. That's who the first person he Holy sent it Holy shit. <laughs> then, then, then he sent it to Davis and then to Zebulon Vance, the governor of North Carolina. Oh but Lee God. got the first message. He found it first. Now, um, just imagine the situation now. The Union is in control of this fort, and, yep. all, and all of a sudden it's party time, okay, on the boats, in the fort. I imagine the officers handing out Fort Fisher champion t-shirts and hats as the confetti's falling. You know, they, yeah. they, 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 they're they, handing they, out the DQ certificates right? for the you know, DQs in Wilmington, maybe. But what's, but with this fort falling now, the death warrant is signed for Wilmington. There's no Absolutely. question, right? So, um, you know, when he does finally message Davis, Davis gets the message and he face palms. He said, and he, he writes back, the intelligence is sad and it is unexpected. Can you retake the fort? If anything is to be done by you, uh, 
you will appreciate the necessity of being attempted without a moment's delay. Okay, sure, sounds good. But again, Brad doesn't do anything. He sits back because again, goes back to the original point I said a little while ago. He thinks if he sends troops that he's going to lose Wilmington, but he yeah. doesn't realize he's lost Wilmington by exactly. losing Fort Fisher, right? He's not and recognizing now, the strategy behind this. But that that is the mortally insane mindset of Braxton Bragg here. Yeah. Because he doesn't realize you can't keep Wilmington and not, and not have Fort Fisher. Mm-hmm. He should have defended Fort Fisher, but for whatever reason, he thought he could fall back to the town and defend that with Fort Fisher gone. And I... I it's got to be one of the more mind-numbing, idiotic moments of military thinking in this entire war. Now, not to spoil the surprise, Mary, but February 19th, you know what happens? I'm going to guess we're going to talk about it in our next episode, right. but Wilmington is not going Wilmington to make is it. Wilmington is going to fall about a month later. So regardless yep. of what this was, it was, the, it was the end of the line. Now, back at the fort on January 16th, um, going back to the fort real quick, there was, you know, there was all that partying going on and there was an incident that did happen, right? Now, basically, the soldiers were getting drunk and they were partying, having a great time. They were shooting off fireworks. They were firing guns up in the air. After the battle um, and all the nights of celebrating, there were several soldiers who were sleeping on the roof of the magazine. That's mm-hmm. where they were sleeping. This is, this is, tr- this is troops, Union oh. troops as well as rebel POWs. Apparently, a couple of drunk Marines went into the magazine, okay, looking for something to, to plunder, who the hell knows what they were doing. But they took lit matches and torches in there, and the whole thing blew up, and it killed 200 guys who were sleeping on the roof. Oh, my God. Including their own men and their own guys. Now, there was an official court inquiry held by this, by a guy named by General Joseph Abbott, who mentioned him earlier, of the 2nd Brigade, as well as a guy named George Towell, um, who was a captain of the 4th New Hampshire, and he's part of Lewis Bell's Brigade, right? The drunken Marines' identities were never discovered or at least mentioned in the official report. So they probably know who did it, but just didn't say anything. But it was kind of a sad ending to this that you lost a lot of lives just because of things being completely out of control. Um, the battle Soon after the battle was going to be over, Terry and Porter received a special guest unannounced, which they must have really loved. When, when Secretary of War Edwin Stanton oh, knocked on God, the door. Oh, God, that would not be my guest of honor. He's and he This was a pop-in. They weren't expecting him, okay? Now, Stanton was thrilled with the results, and he later told Lincoln, you'll be pleased to know that perfect harmony in concert of action existed between our land and naval forces. Admiral Porter and General Terry vied in the commendation each of each other. So this is a direct shot in Butler. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Because what he what he's telling Lincoln is these guys are singing kumbaya, doing each other's nails, having a great time. They get along <laughs> just perfectly. That. I'm and, just picturing and, that. Yeah. <laughs> but look how well things work because they got together and they yeah. got along. And this was a direct shot at Butler. There's no question. Wow. But Terry is going to present Stanton with a Fort Fisher garrison flag. Um, and of course, Stanton is going to write a letter praising both Terry and Porter for their joint operations. And Stanton's going to write about them, the combined operations of the squadron of land forces of your commands deserve and will receive the thanks of a nation. Um, rumor has it, Stanton might have even smiled. We don't know, but he might have actually wow. smiled. So, so he was happy. So, you know, we'll, you know, we'll discuss the fall of Wilmington, the battle yep. of Wilmington in the next episode. Um but for the most part, you know, once the fort was gone, as was the town. Now, we mentioned before how important the, um, the town was as an active supply hub for Lee's yep. army. It is no surprise that with the, about two months later, after Fort Fisher Falls, Lee's going to surrender. And Absolutely why? Not. And when you think of Lee's advance of the Appomattox campaign, what was he doing? He was looking for supplies and yep. food. And the reason why he was because that supply line in Wilmington was cut off from Fort Fisher. It was, yeah. And, you know, the a couple of other things to note about the second battle is there's 54 medals of honor awarded to soldiers who fought here, including one member of the United States Colored Troops. Mm-hmm. Um, it's one of the biggest, you know, um, or, you know, like, I guess amphibious landings in the civil war 
Um, it was the big, it was the biggest amphibious landing that will up, up until D-Day. Up December until D-Day, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's the heaviest uh, naval fire, and yeah, up until D-Day. And the loss of Fort Fisher is going to compromise the safety and usefulness, as we're going to talk about in our next episode of Wilmington. Mm -hmm. It's a huge, it's one of these domino effects, right? Like, and I, I don't think a lot of people realize how much Fort Fisher and Wilmington how much it hinges on what is going to happen at Appomattox in April of 1865. It was, and you mentioned the Medal of Honor is the 54, you know, uh, Curtis and yep. Penny Packer mm -hmm. are going to be, are going to be two of the 54. And Speaking Penny, of Penny Packer, Packer, Penny Packer, I was just going to say Penny Packer is, go ahead, talk about him. Oh no, I, I was, I was going to say, I mean, he, he's a guy who, that he's doing this at age 20. Exactly. Right? It's and, crazy. And he's going to get, he's going to get his star. He's going to get a, he's going to be brevity, but he's going to get yeah. a, a, he's going to become a general at age 20, the youngest general in, 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 in the youngest American born general, because Lafayette got one at age 19, but, yeah. but he got one at age 20, the youngest one. And that's still, that's still affects today. He's still the youngest one in American history. So, yeah. and they know, thought he was going to die of his wounds and he lives until 1916. He lives, well, he lives for he lives for a while. So as far as yeah. as far as living and not living, the casualties, you know that that joint federal and navy losses were just about a thousand, right? Yeah, you know, six fifty for the infantry, and about four hundred or so for the navy. Mostly from Breeze's um, Marines when they were charging that that seawall. The Rebs lost six hundred dead, wounded, but lost that entire garrison, around thirteen hundred guys, including Lamb and Whiting. Now, what's interesting is Lamb. You know, he's survived. He, he's going to spend the next seven years of his life on crutches from this battle. Yep. Okay. And he's going to survive. He'll later become the mayor of, of uh, Norfolk, Virginia. And he's going to switch from being a Democrat to a Republican. And he'll be end up being close friends with General Newton Martin Curtis. Maybe yep. he measured how tall he was. We don't know. But they were close friends. Though Curtis also lost an eye in this battle. So it's kind of it's that. Where is that? But they they were they were actually instrumental in helping calm tensions from the north and the south after the war. They got together yeah, they and fought the combatants at Fort Fisher. We fought, yep. we're both injured, but we, everything could be cool. You know, Curtis, um, you know, he's, he's gonna end up being a big part of that. And I was, you know, Whiting for that, uh, with W. C. Whiting, H uh, William H. C. Whiting rather, he ain't gonna be as fortunate, Mary. Because he's in for a shitty day, right? Yeah. He's going to be taken to prison to Governor's Island in New York Harbor, and he is going to die of dysentery, which is a lot of fun. Of mm. less than two months after surrendering the fort, he's going to he's going to die. He was pissed at Bragg until his dying day, oh, but not I supporting can't imagine him. Why? He was literally in his jail cell writing uh, letters to Richmond, demanding an investigation while he was dying of dysentery. So, you know, so it lets you know. I would love to know if there, like, was there an investigation into that as to why Bragg just ignored him for three days? I, I mean, I think the only thing I could think of is that he did not want to commit troops to Fort Fisher because he thought it was going to weaken Wilmington. He that was going to need no the troops. To, and that's the thing that, 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 that there lies the big mistake there is it doesn't make any sense because he should have known that Wilmington could not exist with, exist with the Fort Fisher. And for whatever reason, he just thought... Yeah. That, that wasn't the case so it can truly be said that the fall of fort fisher was the final nail in the coffin of the confederacy there's no doubt and oh, that surrender in the surrender um the surrender of the fort was it, it changed though it changed the question of the confederacy surrendering to not if but when yeah and exactly, they knew that was the end of the day and no surprise it was, it was going to come about two months later in appomattox with the army of northern virginia and eventually with Bentonville with, with Joseph um, Johnson down the road. Yeah. <laughs> but you cannot overstate enough how important Fort Fisher was <clears throat> and how important it was that the uh, this joint Navy Army venture took care of it because it, it had to be done and they finally did it. it. Took two tries, but they finally did it. Agreed, they did. And so I think that wraps up part two of our discussion about Fort Fisher. Next week, we are going to be talking about Wilmington, which is our final final part in this discussion, the fall of Wilmington, mm -hmm. which is it plays into this. It plays into the fall of Appomattox and the demise of, you know, kind of the Army of Northern Virginia and, and all that plays into the end of the Civil War. Right. Well, this will be a fun one, too, because we're going to, have to talk about John Schofield again. You know, yeah, exactly. The, uh, yeah. Schofield from, from, from Franklin. Now, yeah. it's going to be interesting. We talk about it because you're going to have 
you know, that struggle off line, they're going to fall yeah. back. They're going to fight and fall back. And eventually, um, not to spoil it, but you're going to have Brad, who's going to take a lot of the supplies and get them out of there. Yeah. He's going to burn a lot of the tobacco factories and some of the, the, the warehouses. Mm-hmm. And eventually Schofield will take over Wilmington. He will use that as his launching point for Sherman's Carolina campaign that's going to end up going up towards uh, Benville, we talked about last time. So this is this is going to be the kid that foothold in Wilmington for John Schofield. But it's an interesting thing to talk about. Um, I think Fort Fisher is going to be a situation that um, is studied a lot, but I think it needs to be studied more. Exactly. Because I think not a, lot ha- not a lot is talked about North Carolina, Mary, nope. Italy. It's really, really not. And I think you cannot have a true story of the end of this war without Fort Fisher. And it's why I think that's probably why it ended up in that, that Lincoln movie. That oh, was the I one agree. It is. Focused. Yeah. And that's the one thing that, you know, that's kind of, you know, when we watched that last week, it's kind of like, wow, they're, they're talking about Fort Fisher. It's clearly an important thing in the end of the civil war. You know, it needs to be addressed a lot more. And when you look at it, you really, you reckon like, you know, you kind of fit together these pieces of the civil war puzzle that, you know, Fort Fisher falls, Wil- Wilmington falls, and all of a sudden Richmond falls. And mm-hmm. that's exactly what Robert E. Lee said would happen, right? So you have to look at these, you can't look at the Civil War in these silos of just like, oh, Richmond or Fort Fisher or whatever. Everything has an effect on what else is happening, right? It, it all goes in, but everything it, it was falling apart anyway. The election was over, yeah. Lincoln was a president again. But what this did right now is it just, you know, it was a final piece of Anaconda plan. It really mm-hmm. was the final, yeah. the final, it, like I said before, it was the final nail in the coffin. So I'm glad exactly. I think we did this just as fun talking about it. So we'll talk oh, next week about the fall of Wilmington. So what is coming up next? I know it's Wilmington, but what else is on our agenda? <laughs> Wilmington is coming up next, but uh, next Wednesday night uh, on the 26th, we, Wednesday, the 26th at 6 PM, we have our first book club meeting of 2022, which is about Armistead and Hancock at Gettysburg by Tom McMillan. The author will be joining us for that. Um, even if you haven't read the book, you can join us for that discussion, uh, 6 PM via zoom info at civil war breakfast club.com. Um, our next episode will, um, not be dropping so our next, this episode will be dropping. Actually, you're listening to it right now. Um, but we will be having our usual Facebook lot. We'll be doing our Facebook live on Sunday. So our next episode is going to be on Fort Wilmington. And then after that mill Springs. So we were pushing everything back by a week. So a lot of stuff coming down the pike. Yep. So any, any final words from you, Fincheru? <laughs> so thank you to all of our listeners for these 72 episodes. Um, you guys are awesome. Uh, thank you tonight for the round table as well for those of you that joined us and thank you to you darren for being the awesome co-host and putting up with me as well well not for too being hard kind of get because sometimes i jump ahead and get apparently i turn the way back machine into the let's go forward machine so you're thank doing, you you're, for you're like dr brown you know sometimes but in any case i am but yeah <laughs> any right. final words from you nope i think it was a fun episode it's fun to do this it's always fun to do this with you and look forward to the next action-packed episode of Civil War Breakfast Club. Funko Mary says hello. Hey, Funko Mary. And uh, we will head we'll head off to our next thing. So can Actually, everybody we Owl appreciate Mead. it? Oh God. Says hello. Yes, it's just just like that. Okay. Anyway, so everybody, thanks for, thanks for joining on. We appreciate it. Thanks for listening. Have a great and safe weekend. Stay warm, stay dry, and have a um, a great rest of the work week as well. So thanks everybody for appreciate it. We will talk soon. As always, we'll see you on the other side. Peace out, everybody. See you guys later. Bye.